Hey everyone, welcome to my honest opinions on Monster Train. This is a game that came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a game where you ride a big fiery train, shown here on the screen, uh, called the Bone Shaker, from one end of hell to the other, carrying the last remaining shard of warmth that can uh, light up and unfreeze hell uh, before everything is lost. Um, the most immediate comparison to this game is Slay the Spire. This is a deck building roguelike. Um, it has a lot of the same structures as Slay the Spire to the point where it's not made by the same people, but it is kind of a spiritual sequel to Slay the Spire. Right? It, the design of it feels very informed by uh, the decisions made by the Slay the Spire devs, the cards they made, the uh, kind of lingering weaknesses in Slay the Spire's design. A lot of them have been... Uh, the, the devs of Monster Train have made an attempt to address them, uh, I would say. And um, it adds a bit more more elements to the, the way the game plays out. Um, so... I have to fill a loading screen. Sorry about this. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Is that what I'm supposed to say now? Let's get right into it when this loading screen finishes. Um, I love this game. I think the ideas they've had um, to mix up the formula and allow you to experiment more with a wider set of mechanics um, make... Make Monster Train a very kind of satisfying follow-up for the Slay the Spire. Again, it's not made by the same people, but it does. It does, it feels like a sequel. It feels like they took Slay the Spire and they added more stuff to it um, and kind of smoothed out certain elements that were difficult. For instance, in this game, it's much easier to remove cards from your deck. Um, Monster Train explicitly encourages you to build like an engine, build a set of broken interactions within your deck that make it play out a certain way whereas in slay the spire this was something that was very difficult to do because sometimes you just wouldn't be able to remove the crap cards you started with or wouldn't get powerful enough stuff to make some kind of combo so the ways in which monster train um extends the formula are primarily um the actual train which is like a board it has three floors enemies come in on the first floor and if you don't kill them, they go up to the second floor, and then the third floor, and then the fourth floor, and on the fourth floor is your pyre, which is like this big crystal. Um, it's very similar to like a tower defense game. The pyre is your is your health essentially, and they it, it hits back, but um, generally enemies that reach it will deal damage to you effectively. Um, and if the pyre is destroyed, your run is over. Um, so there's kind of this bit in between your health and the enemy's attacks, unlike in Slay the Spire. In between, you have monsters. Um, the various creatures of hell that you can summon to uh, fight off the invaders. And the monsters come in what the game called clans, which are essentially colours. So in Slay the Spire, you pick a class. So there's... Um, what's the first one called? The Ironclad, which is like a tank class. The uh, the Silent, which is your, your rogue, essentially. Lots of poison and spamming little dagger spells. Um, the Defect, which is a kind of set up and payoff class where you have these orbs that you can sequence and the watcher which is a, a stance based newer class where you can move between stances to increase your damage or um or your mana um and slay the spire it, <laughs> it's like this, in monster train you pick two clans um of different colors i keep gesturing off the screen um you pick two clans of different colors um i haven't unlocked the fifth one yet but so far we have the hellhorned which are uh, relatively aggressive, I guess. Um, they have monsters which hit hard, uh, but can't take too much damage back. Awoken, who are the obvious, uh, who, are the, who are the opposite. These are kind of tanky um, characters with a healing playstyle. Stygian Guard, who benefit from spells. Um, they have spell damage multipliers um, or spell power increases, ways to generate more spells. And finally, the Umbra, who are kind of a um, the theme I've found in these so far is they can make these little creatures called morsels and then the big monsters can eat them and get more powerful um, and they have benefits that they trigger when they eat the morsels 
Um, they also have ways of increasing the capacity of the floors you're on, so you can put like really big monsters on there. And um, uh, another thing to do is like getting more mana every turn, more what's called ember in this game, which allow you to spend, will allow you to play cards. Um, similar to is it energy and slow the spire is energy, right? Um, so you get a primary clan and then an allied clan, so you get to mix and match two of them. And your primary clan gives you a champion, uh, which you can see in the, the, the big picture here. Um, so each, each, each clan has three different champion builds. They're like the same sprite, but different mechanics. Um, and your champion is a free monster that always starts in your opening hand. So you can always play it on turn one. And each one rewards you for doing different things. For instance, um, my favorite one I've found so far is this one. The Awoken Champion. I don't know what it's actually called. But there's one of the uh, one of the options for it is when you heal it, it deals damage to enemies in front of it. Um, and you can just spam regeneration spells on it and therefore spam damage. Very, very effective. Um, so the game gives you this broader array of options from the start. But also allows you more consistency than in Slay the Spire. Because you get this champion that you can most of the time... You, can, you know what it's going to do. You always draw it. Um... You, like I said, there are three type. There are three mechanics each champion can have. So there's essentially three different stats for for it, and you get offered two of them. So you can't always predictably get the same one, but you know, as Meatloaf once said, two out of three ain't bad. Um, and of course, once you've got that champion, you can build around it. Um, similar to Slay the Spire, this game is not that difficult, but it has. In fact, I think it's easier than Slay the Spire to start with. Um, and it has these covenants, which are essentially difficulties. And I think there's 25 of them. Uh, similar to Slay the Spire's Ascensions, which got to 20, I think. Um, and the game, you know, rewards you with... In this, this is quite cool. You unlock foils, essentially, like golden bordered versions of the cards. When you beat high covenant ranks, which is quite cool. Um, so I'm going to start off with this setup, which is... Uh, when you, when you begin, you only have the first two clans unlocked, Awoken and Hellhorn. So I'll start with those. Um, I'm taking Awoken as my primary clan because their champion is really good. Like I said, you can get the, the heal and deal thing. We're on Covenant number one, so I'm going to start with some random cards in my deck. Um, I quite like this mechanic. This is a really good way of like exploring the card pool. So it means you start with a larger starting deck, so it's harder to trim down to a combo. But you also begin with like a wider variety of things that you can do. Um, and it's a nice way of like seeing what is in the game without having to deliberately spend um, upgrades on cards that you you know you don't understand or don't want. Um, you also get to see which variant of the final boss you're going to fight. Um, so I quite like this. One of the problems with um, Slay the Spire is there's a couple of bosses that hard counter like entire classes. Um, the worst one is I think it's called the Timekeeper. Which has a thing where every 12 spells you play, it ends your turn and gains more strength. If you're playing the Silent, the Silent usually relies on spamming spells. So if you get the Timekeeper as your boss, which you have no idea is going to happen until you get there, you're, like, you're boned. It's, so, it's such a hard counter. It's very difficult to beat. Um, so here I get to see this one. Uh, it makes your spells go away. <laughs> the first spell you played each turn is lost permanently. So here I know I don't want to build a deck that is like focused on spamming lots of spells if I want to beat this final boss. Um, and I'm starting with a little damage spell, a thing that provides armor, which makes my units tankier, and uh, a thing that prevents units from moving up a floor and draws a card. Which is, you know, it's quite nice. Um, so straight up, I get an artifact, which is very similar to well, the relics in Slay the Spire, it's the things that give you a permanent bonus. And a champion. So I'm going to see what artifacts I get first before I choose a champion. So I can make my pyre attack harder. Or I can have all my spells deal plus three damage. That seems real good. I'm picking that. You can also see your starting deck. This is great because uh, the Hellhorned starting deck has three of this torch. Which deals two damage normally. And now it deals five because I just took that artifact. Um, got this healing spell which we're probably going to use with the champion. Um, here is my champion. It doesn't have any text yet. We're about to give it some. Uh, and we've also got this Vine Grasp that I got randomly given. And these basic units called Train Stewards. So you always start with three spells from one clan, three spells from the other, 
four train stewards and your champion, and then on high covenants you get these um, extra starting cards that are random. So, champion options, what have we got? Okay, we've got my favourite one, probably going to pick that. Or we can have this one which uh, deals damage when it's attacked. So you have this one relies on letting the opponents attack you. This one doesn't, so I'm going to pick this one. So our plan is to just heal the crap out of this and reap the profits. So before you go into each fight, you get a little view on how what enemies you're going to face. Um, so we can see each encounter uh, has a boss at the end, um, like a, a mini boss essentially. And we've also got these um, basic enemies that are going to run at us. One relatively tanky enemy that doesn't hit very hard and one enemy that can heal it, which we're probably going to try and snipe with removal spells. You've also got these trials. These are very cool. So it, you, you can optionally make each uh, encounter more difficult. But you get a benefit at the end. Um, and you get more XP as well. This one makes these enemies deal more damage. This one's a healer, so it doesn't actually attack. So it only, it only affects these ones, essentially. Which will make them hit for 6 instead of 2, which is a big jump. But I think I'm going to take this. Because a unit draft gives me an extra unit at the end. Very powerful. And the, the trial always defaults to off, so I don't have to turn it off again for the next one or accidentally mess myself up. Um, how are we doing audio-wise? Just fine. This game has an amazing soundtrack. It gets stuck in my head all the time. Okay, so I've managed not to draw... Oh, there we go. We've got a train steward. Plan A. Um, I like putting this on the lower floor. Um, I don't actually have any way of healing it this turn. But I can ensure that this Forged Disciple gets stuck there so I can try and kill it next turn. Ultimately, I can let it go further up uh, and try and deal with it later. But I think I'm going to attempt to draw some healing spells first. So I'll play out my Sentient. Um, and I can play my Train Steward, which will deal more damage. You can see this floor has like a limited capacity and the units have a size at the top. So there's only so much I can fit on a given floor. Let's just do this while I'm thinking. Uh, we'll root this so it doesn't move up. So it's going to hit my Sentient for 6, which is quite a lot, but she's got 25 HP, so it's fine. Um, I'll jam this Train Steward, throw a Torch at it as well, because I may as well. Um, like Slay the Spire, if you don't use any cards in your hand at the end of the turn, they just get discarded, and that's that. Hit End Turn. Oh, let me slow that down a little. Um, so, in fact, let me put that on normal speed. So at the end of each turn, the enemies attack and then you do. It's sort of rushed through that. I apologize. I had it on fast from last time. We've also had this spawn, which is a, a thing that basically gives us extra money if we kill it. Um, so I'll just put a unit next to it to contest that. Right, we've got some healing now, so let's let's begin this nonsense. Oh, of course. The spell, the magic power affects this as well, so we heal for more. That's amazing. What a good artifact. So every time I heal this, it deals 15 to this unit in front of it. Um, and this also applies a regen stack, so it'll heal again at end of turn. Um, which I think is the same thing as in Slay the Spire, it's called regeneration. The best thing is that also triggers its ability, even if it's on full HP. Um, so we're going to get another trigger of 15 damage on this Disciple. Bye. Uh, we can snipe some units as well. Let's kill... Oh, I've run out of Ember, so I can't cast this. But I can give this armor, just to help it tank through all these 6 attack units that I'm throwing at it. And uh, we'll kill that, because I can. Can't cast this, so we pass the turn. Back on attack. My uh, train ster servant will hit it. Train steward, whatever they're called. Um, this can't attack, but we get the regen. Deals 15 damage. There's always a turn when nothing happens before the boss shows up. That's called a brief respite. Respite. Um, let's jam another train servant. So this is going to go to 10 HP. We can't quite kill it this turn. But this train steward should finish it off next turn. Um, with the aid of this damage spell. Just tank this up more. Give it that regen stack. So now it'll regen end of this turn. Which will do nothing. But also next turn. And we're good to go. Finally here comes the boss. There he is. Um, so the way bosses work. Is they have an ability called relentless. Um. We're going to fight back and forth until something is dead. So as you can see here, um, once, the, uh, once the train gives you previews of combat, so here I can see that my units are going to die and this boss is going to take 55 damage, which is quite bad. Like, that's not a lot of... Um, excuse me. That's not a lot of damage, considering all I've got left is 
some random train stewards. So we're going to need to do some healing. So if I heal this, he takes a bunch of damage. And now you can see he's going to take more damage because we've got the regen stacks at the end of each combat. Do it again. We're very close to winning the game here. Let's get rid of that so it doesn't heal him. Now he's taking more damage. I can tank this up so he can survive for an additional turn. We'll try and draw a card next. Oh, he's immune to it. But we'll, we'll draw a card, an extra card next turn anyway. So it looks like my units are going to die, regardless. Uh, we're going to get three triggers off this, which are going to deal at 45 damage and a bunch of hits from the train steward. But eventually the boss is going to grind through them and kill them. And it'll move on to the next floor, but fortunately it should die to the train stewards there. And the trigger. So we're just going to do this over and over again until both sides are dead. So I'm just going to speed this up a little. This game speed button is a godsend. You sometimes get bosses where they have like five attacks a turn. And uh, <laughs> you're just hitting each other back and forth for ages. And being able to speed it up to like a ridiculous degree makes that much easier. So my uh, train steward is going to kill this. Or rather my train steward at the back is going to kill this. Because uh, the boss is going to kill this steward first. But we don't need to worry about that. Bye-bye. So we win. Gives us some XP. We get bonuses uh, for beating the boss quickly. Activating a trial. Now we get some money. Um, a random card from one clan. A random card from the other clan. And this extra bonus where we get a unit um, from, our, um, from our trial activation. Normally, these packs just give you spells. And units are required specially. And that's partly because of the slots. Like the... Having lots of units in your deck only helps if they die. Um, so what have we got? We can buff a unit by a lot of damage and make it slightly less healthy. This is pretty good. We could put this on our champion to make it attack for 8 every turn. That's kind of strong. Um, Sting. This gives us 8 damage thanks to our Tempered Talisman. It would normally be 5 to the front enemy unit. And we draw an extra card next turn, which is very strong. Gives us extra card draw. Um, to cycle through the deck and lets us have bigger tons as well as being quite an effective removal spell. It just kind of adds up. Or a plus three plus three spell. This card is quite good. It's unassuming, but it's it's quite strong. I like this a lot for our champion. Um, eight damage every turn seems better than eight damage once, even though I do like Sting a lot. Um, and this is also really good with any unit that can like attack multiple enemies at once or attack twice, of which we have access to quite a few in these... Uh, these clans. So I'm going to pick Razor Sharp Edge. Uh, this is a nice little AoE spell. This is a small unit that gives a bunch of armor to something. This is probably the pick, actually. Oh, this card is really good. And we're currently... All of our units in the starting deck have two size. And the floors have five capacity. So these imps are kind of free in terms of slots on your, on your floors. So let's grab that. And now we have our unit draft. So here we get a thing that hits hard, but has no HP. A thing that hits hard, but has no HP. And it attacks before enemies do, which is quite good. Uh, or a thing that is hits hard and has lots of HP, but we can't cast yet, because it costs four. We, we only get three Ember a turn. We can get this running after a boss. Because um, after each major boss, you get a permanent upgrade that gives you um, more mana every turn, or more card draws, or more capacity. Um, but I think for now, I'm going to pick one of these... Probably this one, most of the time the unit in the front is quite tanky. Um, but if we combine this with our champion, who can deal damage before combat with her healing ability, um, we can kill off even quite large units before they get to attack, um, preserving the champion's health. So let's give this a try. So after every run, we get kicked back to this world map. You saw this earlier very briefly. And I'll just scroll through it. There's, oh, that's dizzying. There's a, a series of um, a series of circles of hell essentially that we're going to travel through. And the ones in front of us are frozen, but we're going to melt them as we get there with the pyre. Each one you get to choose two directions that give you a series of rewards. So in this case, we can forge our units, which allows us to pay a little bit of gold to make them better, um, and gain another unit in the Awoken faction. Or we can forge our spells to make them better and gain a Hellhound unit. This is a, I think this is always the first choice. I like to go for forging the units because giving units a big bonus to their health or damage is really strong. Because, um, you know, the units stick around, so you get that benefit every turn. Whereas the spells 
are something you can upgrade kind of later on when you're looking to streamline your deck or increase the power of your big tones. So let's go this way. Um, I'm going to... You can do these in any order, regardless of where they appear. So I'm going to get a unit first, because then I can upgrade it. Oh, these are both quite good. So you'll notice these are quite large. Um, Awoken have these very tanky units that tend to take up a lot of slots, but are really, really resilient. Um, these hollows have a low HP to start with, but you can heal them way more, because it gains 40 maximum health when you play it. So you can heal it up to 55. And every time it's healed, it gains spikes, which makes it... Uh, deal damage when it's attacked. So this this is pretty good. The only downside with this unit is that we're also going to be spending a lot of our healing on our champion, which is kind of... We want to maximize using our healing on that. So, and this unit doesn't do very much unless you're healing it a lot. This one, on the other hand, gives you mana. So it's expensive to play, and not that big, but it gives you mana when it gets hit, uh, which is really strong, so you can have big turns following up. So I'm going to grab this. And then probably make it bigger, because... Five is not that big of an attack. So here we have Strength Stone, which can... Uh, these, these these are randomized. You usually get two minor effects and a big effect. Um, and you can also remove cards from your deck. So these, these merchants, similar to Slay the Spy, you can always pay to get rid of cards, which I might do, actually. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can give a unit more health, we can give a unit more damage, all the way around, and uh, we can make a unit take up more space on a floor, but be massive. Large stone is usually very powerful, so let's have a look at what we have access to. We have this thing, which currently has like very little health. We have this welder helper, which we could turn into a relevant card, but then we lose the fact that it's just this little unit that can deal, that can take up an extra slot. Or we can make this really big, but that means we can't hide anything behind it to deal relevant amounts of damage. Um, I quite like the idea of making this big, actually. <clears throat> But the Animus of Speed is probably the pick. Only 3 health is really bad if the enemy has any AoE or spikes. Whereas making this huge makes it a much bigger threat. On the flip side, actually, making it take up 3 slots means... No, we can still hide it behind the champion. That's all good. Let's do that. It always pays to think ahead about how much you're fitting on each row. This game really rewards you for having a very specific build. Okay, this unit goes here, this unit goes here, this unit goes here. My more successful runs have always had that kind of element of like, this is where I'm putting my stuff. Um, these upgrades are cheap, so let's grab them. Um, I quite like the idea of making this hit harder again, but I think we need this to be like relevantly sized. So let's just pour both the upgrades into it. Um, giving it more HP will make it... Like, we don't quite need to micromanage it with um, regen, which is good because that leaves us more opportunity to spend health on our champion so i'm out of money and i've picked up my unit so it's on to the next fight i reckon i'm going to go as far as the first major boss in this video because we're already pushing the 25 minute mark so this time what have we got this time this one puts horrible curse cards in your deck that can damage that just clog up your hand we've got these tanky folks again and a boss that has spikes very glad i just upgraded the hp on my fragile unit um so every time you hit this thing, you take two damage, which is not that much, but it adds up quickly, um, given that you attack it back and forth. This trial, at the start of battle, they get a bunch of units on each floor. Uh, we don't have any AoE effects to clay them all off easily, so I'm going to leave this one. I'm going to skip that. So do we have a way of killing this? We sure do. Oh, this is a really nice draw, actually. This is big enough to instant kill this Forged Disciple before it gets to attack, which is pretty sick. We're definitely putting this down here. Um, you notice that the sprite is big. The large stone just makes them actually larger. Um, I can play my Sentient here, or I can... in front of it. Or behind it, actually. This just has lots of health, but given I'm going to be spending healing effects on this, I'm happy with it taking damage. Now, I have the option here of... I can play my Wilting Sapwood, which is quite an expensive card. Um, or I can remove this and not have the rubbish card drawn next turn. I think getting the Sapwood down is better. I'm out of mana now because this is expensive. So you'll notice that this attacked first. 
thanks to the uh, the quick ability that it has. Um, if I play this Welder Helper up here, it will give this HP or give this armor and um, deal with this Collector after the Sapwood kills the Reconciler. It means I can't put a 5 attack unit behind it later. That is worth considering. Uh, we have the same problem down here. Let's just kill this. I quite like the idea of getting the getting the extra gold. Killing these is really, really worth it. It adds up so quickly. We'll just get rid of this. I don't need to heal this yet because it's not taking any damage and this is going to get insta-killed by the Animus of Speed. So, let's do this. So this took a damage, so now we're going to get uh, an extra mana next turn, which is quite helpful. Uh, except nothing is happening. Cool. Um, there's actually not a ton of point in applying regen to this just yet, but I may as well so that it's... Oh, it's already on full HP. Everything is on full HP. Let's deploy these train stewards. There is a consideration here of, like, killing this... To free up a slot. Because we're going to draw a train steward next turn. And it hits harder than the welder helper does. So I think I'm actually going to delete that. And then I can draw it again. And apply it to one of these if I need to. Which is kind of cute. There's lots of cool interactions in this game like that. Um, I'm bored. Let's heal my thing for no reason. Right. Here we go. So it looks like we're going to be alright. This is going to this is gonna die. But the animus of speed is going to destroy everything. Um, we don't really have a ton of... We don't <laughs> manage not to draw any healing. Um, which is very helpful. Didn't even have any left in the deck. I drew it all beforehand. We need more healing cards. Um, may as well clear these off. Give this some extra health, why not? And, uh, let this play out. So there's actually a downside with having given this an attack value. Which is that it takes the damage from the spikes. But like, this Animus of Speed hits so hard that it doesn't matter. Um, right, give me healing spells, please. Yes. Yes, this is a good one. So consume means the card is removed from your deck for the remainder of the uh, the, the round, the battle, when you cast it. Um, so what's the mechanic in Slay the Spire called? Don't even remember. Um, but it, the same thing exists in Slay the Spire. Um, but it applies regen 5. So that's 5 healing triggers over the course of the next 5 turns. Which, you know, when you're dealing 15 damage per trigger, that adds up real fast. This is a pretty good card that gives attack and spikes. So it's worth considering. And we, another one of these also worth considering. But um, this is so good. We, we are needing these healing effects. Another Welder Helper... Uh, I'm starting to fill up my slots. Now I've got two units with three size, so I don't need this. This is pretty good as AoE damage, just to clean out, like, random dorks. Um, it deals plus three damage, so even if we pay zero for the X, um, it still deals three, which is quite nice. Um, or we can have this expensive card that temporarily increases a unit's attack, which doesn't seem very good. Uh, I think I will take this vent. That is quite a powerful ability. But hopefully we're going to find a thing that lets us remove cards from our deck here. Okay, so we've got Forge our units again, which is good. Heal the Pyre, which we don't need. Um, or gain an Artifact and a Hellhorned unit. And either way we get this Concealed Caverns, which lets us get a special effect. These are like the events in Slay the Spire. They're a bit rarer in this game, but there's um, they do similarly kind of varied things. And then we've got a big boss. This is uh, Daedalus. It's always the same boss, but... Again, there are, there are small variations. I think Daedalus has two different abilities. Um, Daedalus' thing is he places bombs on the levels that when they attack, they explode and deal 10 damage to whatever's in front, which is quite a lot. Um, and he can either give them damage prote protection, so they ignore the first instance of damage they take every turn, so you can't clear them off with spells very easily, or all of his units deal one damage to the front enemy unit when they die. Um, which is something you can sometimes exploit to get lots of revenge triggers. Like getting lots of mana off of our Wildwood Symbiote. <coughs> Not Wildwood Symbiote, whatever it's called. Wilting Sapwood. 
One wood symbiote is a Magic the Gathering card. It has nothing to do with this game. Um, I'm very tempted by the artifact, but forging units is generally like... Well, you saw how effective the, like, the huge uh, animus of speed was. On the other hand, we don't have that many things to upgrade. We have this, which is like fine. And we have these train stewards, which I'm hoping to eventually get rid of. Um, so right now, I think the main benefit of the merchant would be getting rid of a train steward, which probably isn't worth it compared to getting an artifact. So let's hide over this side and uh, roll the dice. When a card with consume is played, restore five pyre health. That's pretty good. When a friendly unit is healed, deal damage to the front enemy unit equal to the amount healed. Well, given that we're trying to play a healing deck, that seems like a good thing to do, doesn't it? What units do we have here? So the Horned Warrior, we don't really need this. Um, it does hit fairly hard, but it's not a particularly exciting card, I would say. Um, Railbeater has kind of a cool ability where you can nudge the big tanky units to the back so your other attackers can clear off the like small utility creatures that often hide behind them. Um, it's kind of small, but it has a lot of armor. I don't know if this is worth picking up, considering it means it kind of clogs up our deck, but it is certainly an upgrade over a train servant. Steward. Train steward. Um, like, maybe we can pick this up and then put the, the champion on the second row where she can deal damage to the small things. Um, I don't know. Let's, uh... You know what, let's pick this card up, because this is a video and it's a cool card. Right, what do we have here? Ember deposits frozen in place collect around openings in the ground. A byproduct of the pyre, these energy sources have gone dormant. A closer inspection, one mound of this rubble seems to have something more powerful protruding from it. While you could take the protrusion, <clears throat> uh, removing some of the ember deposits and hauling them from the area would help to eventually revive them with some power, granting you something later on. So if I take the protrusion, I get some bad cards, where if I keep them in my hand at end of turn, they deal my pyre damage, but I get two extra mana every turn. So these will clog up my hand um, when I draw them, but I get more mana per turn. Or I get three copies of this card that does nothing, um, that I can pay three mana for to remove it, but I get something better later on. I have no idea what that later on is. I picked this once, but then I like lost the next match. So I don't know what it does. I might pick this so I can find out what it does. Hopefully they uh hopefully they activate before the like the following boss after this one. Um because she is a beating. Alright, so here we go. Explosive sigil. Enemy units deal one damage to the front unit on death. Um So Daedalus likes to spam little expendable things. So the, the way the bosses work is really cool. It's very similar to a normal battle, except you also have better music and this um, big dude who will float around at the side. <clears throat> Every turn they move to a different floor and they'll use an ability. In this case, he makes a bomb. Um, this is going to do nothing on its turn. It just blows up. It doesn't go up levels or anything, so we can ignore it. Um, we have this legion of little annoyances who, uh, they'll deal less damage if we ignore them for a bit. <clears throat> and I don't have any healing in hand, so that is kind of tempting, I'll be honest. Um, but I think getting the sentient down and cleaning out follow-up enemies, like, she's going to take a bunch of damage, but, like, we have these healing spells. We can fix that, I hope. Um... So we'll play her. Let's get rid of one of these. I should have done that the other round, so she didn't take one damage. I'm going to wait until I draw the Animus. The Animus of Speed, I think, to um, play behind this. So, the Rail Beater can go... I want this to be in the front. I think on the second row, I want the one that makes mana. So this can go up here. Do I have anything good to place behind it? I don't think so. It's just going to be one of these. Um, now I'm out of mana. So that explodes. It goes away. 
These two are going to hit my sentient for a bunch of damage. And then climb up. Right. Give me Animus of Speed. Here we go. Booyah. So that's going to die straight away. Um, we can clear these out with removal spells. And just let these climb up to the top where the Railbeater and Train Steward will deal, deal with them. So we kill this. <clears throat> kill this. Actually, that said, I'm tempted. I'm going to ensnare one of these. Because then it will stay there and next turn it can get hopefully killed by... If I draw this, um, we can. it'll die to this and only deal it one damage. And we can get the extra um, extra mana. This is going to get OTG'd by the Animus of Speed. You'll also notice that if there are no units in the way, the uh, our units get to attack the boss even before the boss fight bit has started. Hey, we drew the sapwood. Worth it. Right. Um, so this is going to get killed by the Animus. I wonder if there's a way I can clear this off now. I can deal 30 to it, which is annoying. Is that enough? That'll deal... Oh, that almost kills it. Oh no, I think that does the job. If I don't play the Sapwood, I can kill everything here. Which is probably worth it. I certainly want my Sentient to not die, so let's let's do that. So we heal this. Let me heal it again. Um, I missed something. Why did it just die? I dealt it 15 damage. 30 damage. Did it get hit last turn? Am I not paying attention? Whatever, I'll take it. Um, it's dead now. That's all good. Um, this suggests that I can kill this. Uh, and I can also spend a spell on Daedalus himself. Or on killing one of these. Um, preserving one HP on my... Uh, Thing up there. Actually, if I kill this, it also saves the extinguish. So that's two damage. It's not very exciting. Actually, I can play this as well. Small efficiency gains. Sorry, Welting Sapwood. I love you, really. Oh my god, that's so many. And I just used my vent. Right, what do we got? So I can use this to get a bunch of regen going on my... Uh, Sentient, which will kill a cleric at end of turn. Can't use the Welder Helper, unfortunately. But I can use it up here. Uh, to give this a bunch of extra health. Um, and I can play a Train Steward on the middle. Uh, in the hope that it can then hide behind my um, Wilting Sapwood when I finally draw that again. And clear off a couple of the clergymen when they rise up next turn. These also get to get some damage in. And at end of turn, this will regen. <clears throat> it definitely triggered twice. What was that about? Is that a bug? That's weird. <laughs> Not sure what happened there, actually. Right, this is going to die to a bomb. Can we do anything about that? No, unless we spend both fortifies on keeping it alive. Can we have a few more train stewards in the deck and nothing to do with them? I'm actually okay with it. Um, absorbing the bomb hit. It's a bit rough, but not a huge problem. Um, over here, let's make sure our sentient doesn't die anytime soon. And I think I will... Ironically, decrease her health with this. But that's also convenient because the Animus is going to kill the Disciple and then the Sentient can finish off the Trusted Priest. Right, now we're going to fight the boss. Um, so the Relentless rule applies as before. Um, as you can see, the boss is actually going to die uh, in exchange for the Sentient because the Animus of Speed is going to presumably... 
beat him up. But uh, let's see if we can swing that calculus a little, little. Why not? And there he goes. Bye, Daedalus. See you later. Um, so we now have some money. A rare pack of spells mixed from both classes. Uh, a unit draft. We get another unit, which is great. Because we're still running some of these train stewards. And major enhancements. Um, which will give us uh, an option of more mana, more capacity on each floor, or more cards every turn. Enhance a unit with plus 10 health, apply spikes 4. That seems really strong, but it costs a lot. This feels like a card where you buy it and then you basically don't use it until you can take it to uh, a shop and make it cost one. Um, we can double the amount of rage on friendly units. Well, we don't have anything with rage, so we can ignore that. Oh, here is a rage card, but this is a little expensive what it is. I'm kind of tempted to skip all of these. I guess giving bonus HP and spikes to my um, sentient isn't terrible. Spikes is quite nice because it helps kill off little units that have like, you know, that the deal like four or five damage each and have very low health. It means you don't need spells to deal with it. Like, you just have to tank the actual damage, which is fine if you're supporting it with lots of healing. Um, but on the flip side, I kind of want to... My deck is already looking a little full. I don't know what these are going to turn into, but with 26 cards, which is a lot, I need to remove some of these to consistently draw the cards I actually want. So I think I'm going to skip this. Um, here. Oh, these are pretty good. So I might take this now because we're going to get the extra mana. And this card is very good. Um, it is another three size unit, but we do have space for that <coughs> in the roster. Just about. Um, pleasingly, you can also play it on turn one alongside the Sentient. Because uh, the Sentient costs zero. This is quite a good card. Um, sweep means it attacks in an AoE, so it can deal with all those little crappy things I mentioned before. Um, this is a very good card to plant upgrades on. It's got a lot of HP, so it can be tanky. And if you give it, like, bonus damage and quick, or multi-strike or something, which it, where it attacks more than once, um, it can really stack up the damage. The other nice thing about sweep is that you can get chip damage in on bosses if they're on the same floor as the enemies you're attacking, which is quite nice. This gives you a, a spell every turn. The stings are, you saw this earlier, is like deal 5 damage to the front enemy unit, or 8 with the artifact, draw an extra card next turn. Quite good. Um, this gives you them for free every turn. The downside is it takes a, quite a bit of space, um, and doesn't actually hit enemy units. Um, but you can upgrade it to give it an attack as well, to kind of double up on that power. So this could be worth doing, given that we have the, uh, the Tempered Talisman. The stings kind of fill up your deck after a while, but because they make you draw cards, it doesn't really matter. And for the first few turns where you're playing them, you start motoring through your deck more quickly. So they have quite a strong benefit. I think this is the best card here. I really rate the Demon Fiend. It's really strong. I'll grab that. And then finally, we're going to take the bonus mana. Bonus mana is where it's at. So you can kind of see that, like... I'm going to wrap the video up here, but... Um, the rest of the run is kind of the same sort of thing. You've got um, th two more normal battles, the second boss, one more normal battle, one more boss, this is the final boss, and then that's the end of the end of the run. Um, so each each run is not very long; it's eight rounds. So you, there's a bit less. I find there's a bit less fatigue in this game than with Slay the Spire. If you do multiple runs, um, especially if you're using the same strategies. It can start to feel samey. But the fact that you get like... Um, the fact that you always get to do some kind of combo... Um, encourages experimentation. Because when you try to do stuff in Monster Train... It's much easier to get away with it than in Slay the Spire. Where it's quite easy to remove cards from your deck. Like even here, we can take either of these options where we get... I can remove two cards from my deck. Duplicate a card. Um... So I can get an extra copy of a card that I'm relying on, which counts upgrades, which is very spicy. 
So I can duplicate my large stoned um, Animus of Speed, for instance, or would if I hadn't already filled up my deck with big monsters. Um, and you get an extra unit and an upgrade to your champion, which allows you to um, kind of double up on its abilities or mix it. Like you can, I'll just show you. It's the same as the last, um, the, f the first kind of choice. So you get an option of one or the other. Um, so in this case, I can draw cards when it gets hit or I can have a rejuvenate ability or I can double up on my rejuvenate. This is so powerful that like, I, I've never not picked this. Um, but like, the other option is you get some money, upgrade your spells and heal your, um, your boss, your boss, your base, your pyre. Um, and the merchant also lets you remove cards from your deck. So it's quite easy to like, if you're willing to spend the gold, and gold is not in massively short supply, especially if you're managing to do some trials. Um, it's very easy to trim your deck down considerably. Um, so in this case, I would maybe remove like, I'll probably train stewards to start with because I'm running out of space for them, right? So we can get rid of these. Um, I can duplicate any card so I can double up on my powerful creatures. I can double up on a spell that I'm using. In this case, I probably want to duplicate this to get extra triggers on my on my hero. Because um, the, the way regen works is the more you have of it, the better it gets. Because you get larger regen numbers and it lasts longer. So consistently getting like triggers at the end of every turn is really nice. Especially pairing it with the animus to like plow through enemies in front and then you can get the regen to kill off something behind. It's quite nice. So I'll duplicate that. And I can pick a new unit. Maybe this. Both of these. I'm probably going to pass on this just because my deck is already full of things and neither of them is particularly powerful unless I upgrade it. So I would skip this and just get the money. Um, and you can see that, like, my deck gets more consistent and more interesting every time. Like, I've trimmed out starter cards with not too much effort. I've got duplicate combo pieces to go with my champion that I always draw, and it costs zero. So there's no reason not to play it, um, ever. Um, and... I'm keeping my deck at a manageable size. Here it's a bit exaggerated because I've got these calcified embers. Um, and I haven't removed anything previously. But a lot of the time you can trim your deck down to like 15 cards and just sit there cycling through it and doing... kind of maintaining your engine. And you might also see, just looking at it again, that like... I've got a plan for all my slots, right? Like, these two go together, or maybe this and the Demon Fiend, kind of the same thing. Um... The rail beater is going to go with probably a train steward right now, but something else later. And we've got a wilting sapwood that I'll pair with, again, a train steward right now, but later on it'll be something harder hitting. Um, so when I get like more exciting units than the ones I just rejected, I'll pair them up with um, my tanky kind of frontliners. Which also suggests that I might want to get rid of this welder helper, because I have three, three size units. I'm not going to be able to fit this in very often. Um, and eventually I'll start removing things like the torches because um, they have a lot of little direct damage spells and they don't do very much against the tanky units you encounter later on or against bosses um, unless you're stacking up spell damage which this deck is not um, and so you get to hone in on a deck that is an engine with itself um, it's very easy to like try stuff and have it be interesting and cool um I would say more so than in Slay the Spire, where I often find myself kind of at the mercy of randomness in the early game of like, am I going to get cards that set me up to do something good? Or later on you get stuck and you're like, I can't really pivot. My deck is, you know, too many cards. I don't have enough options left to pick up new cards and every card I add to my deck dilutes it further. It's a bit, that is more easily managed in Monster Train because you plan ahead more and thanks to the upgrades... Um, you can turn basically any old crap into a functioning fighting force by just giving a bad unit plus 10 plus 10 um, or multi-strike or whatever. Um, making bad spells cost zero makes them really good. Um, you know, you can salvage 
bad or unlucky drafts um, or mistakes. You know, if you like change your mind about how you want to approach a draft, um, you can do that. Um, so I've really enjoyed the greater feeling of flexibility and consistency compared to Slave the Spire. I think the one thing that the one downside of this um, is that like when you can do the same thing every run, like I've played this color combination three or four times now with this champion and like the details have been different every time and the different random starting cards do help with that a lot uh, when you get to covenant one you have to beat the game once to unlock it but um they really help like mix up the texture of each draft um and you definitely have like better or worse loadouts that you have to adapt to but um the fundamental combo of like i'm gonna play this and heal it a bunch doing that consistently will get old faster than like trying to do consistent things in Slay the Spire because the way you fall into those consistent mechanics is more varied in Slay the Spire. Um, the flip side is that like this game doesn't kind of... In Slay the Spire it can be... I sometimes feel like I get wasted runs where it's like well I tried to do something cool but it didn't work or well I wanted to experiment but the game handed me the same cards I drafted last time or whatever um and i think that like monster train gives you more control over whether you want to refine a strategy you understand or try something new um i also find that it's it can be more punishing than slay the spire if you play a unit in the wrong place or at the wrong time and like mess up your capacity or your structures um it can make it really hard to finish a round. Thanks to the the way the pyre actually works, like a counterattack. So units don't usually kill it in one go when they get there. Um, but if you mess up on a boss fight, you can be in real trouble. Um, so it does actually have, like, the game is not that difficult, but it does have a good amount of strategic bite to it, I've found. Like, it's, when you get, when you do stuff well in this game, it rewards you very obviously. Like, um, I unlocked the Umbra faction in my first attempt at them. I ended up making these units that, like, every time they attacked, they healed themselves. With, like, a combo that repeatedly applied the buff that says, when you next attack, you heal yourself. Um, and they were so, like, I would just stack up, like, 20 instances of that buff. And when you come to do the boss, the boss is hitting the thing for 40 a turn, but it's got, like, 40 or 50 attack and lifesteal, so it's just healing every turn and just kills the boss by itself. Um, which is ridiculous um another time like there's a hellhorned champion where you can get it so that it attacks twice a turn and stacks up damage every time it kills things by combining two of the branches um and that means that against bosses every time it attacks it deals like 300 damage uh and so it's fragile so they will they will kill it eventually but like by the time it dies you've hit them for like 1200 and the rest of your heroes can your rest of your units can clean up so it when you learn how the game when you learn how like structuring your builds works i felt i found that very satisfying um and i'm still learning like different roles for very mundane looking units like this animus of speed is not a it's not a complicated creature but like how different units interact with upgrades and with positioning um like units that have abilities that trigger when they kill stuff you often want to put those on higher floors so that your lower units can weaken enemies first there's like loads of little subtleties like that in it that obviously slay the spire doesn't have because it doesn't have the floors and units um, and that's not to detract from the complexity and nuance in slay the spire which is a very satisfying game that i love and have a bunch of hours in um especially the new hero the watcher well, new it's months old now but the watcher is really cool when the switches between stances requires a lot of forward planning. Um, but I do like how Monster Train... I mean, most people on this on this channel, most people watching this video, you'll be familiar with Duelist. This is the Duelist to Slay the Spire's Hearthstone in the sense that it is a little bit more complicated and a lot more consistent. Um, and that comparison also applies... Like, there's a... Hearthstone is sometimes considered to be strategically unfulfilling. And I don't think that's true of Hearthstone. And it's certainly not true of Slay the Spire. Um, 
But like, Duelist is certainly more complex and nuanced than Hearthstone is in its core mechanics. Um, and that's not necessarily the case here. I think Slay the Spire has stuff that this game doesn't. Um, and I think that Slay the Spire forces you to think on your feet more because it's less consistent in your runs. Um, but the the overall difference where like Duelist allows you to use positioning to make and and um, to make your units work for you in a way that just playing them on a board in a normal CCG doesn't. And the replace mechanic makes your draws much more consistent. And I think Monst uh, Monster Train has the same thing. I keep wanting to call it Monster Hunter. Monster Train has the same thing where playing your units and letting them do work for you over the course of the entire round makes the game much more consistent when you position them correctly and allows for strategic nuances that go above and beyond this is just a ball of stats. If there's a ball of stats in the right place, all of a sudden that makes a big difference. Um, but that can also lead to, in the same way as in Duelist, they always have Mechanical Warbeast on turn 6, and I think Monster Train... I'm hoping that, like, over the course of its lifespan, presumably the devs are going to add more stuff to it or release DLC or something, because this seems like a game that is ripe for DLC. Extra factions, extra cards, extra bosses. There's loads of stuff you could do to make it more varied. Um, and I think that right now, this this it's not an early access, like this is a release, but, you know, in, this is late... <laughs> this is 2020, like, games are developed over time nowadays, and I would be un I would be very surprised if Monster Train didn't use the fact that it's a card game to have that sort of long tail of support and releasing DLC and new updates to bring people back to the game or bring new people into the game. Um, and we might see, like, way more complicated card and enemy mechanics, where right now, like, a lot of the enemies we just fought, very simple. One roll or zero. Ball of stats with, like, a healer behind it straightforward and there's you know it's a card game so there's tons of design space for stuff you could do um you know even just looking at like if you want to rip off stuff from slay the spire there's everything from like the splitting slimes to units that get back up after they die to um I'm trying to think of other cool slay the spire units like units that have particular interactions with armor there are more like later on there's um units that trigger when stuff dies there's like a fight where the enemy units skip the second floor unless you kill like the little support unit at the back um which like really changes how you play because like the floor two is almost irrelevant half the time unless you've got a bunch of direct damage or like sweep enemies like uh, sweep units that can kill the things at the back just loads of stuff like that that can really challenge you to like apply the very simple and elegant tools the game gives you in a new way which is the you know, probably the number one biggest strength of every single card game. And it certainly applies here. Um, so yeah, I've been really enjoying this game. I think, overall, I would say that, like, I am... I've had more fun with it than I had with Slay the Spire so far. Like, at first blush, I've probably put something like 10 hours in uh, since I bought it. Which was, like, a week ago. Um... That's partly because I needed a comfort game that I could play while eating. Um, I've got bored of my Hearthstone deck. <laughs> and so I just wanted something that I could, you know, I like games that you can play one-handed while you're just eating. Um, no, not like that. Uh, and this has scratched that itch and I've been having a stressful time at work. So it's good to just have a, you know, a game that is chilling me out. So it's been very good for that as well. Um, but yeah, I heartily recommend Monster Train if you're into Slay the Spire. Or if you just like cool art, good music, and uh, a sort of relatively unique take on a story about angels and demons. You know, it's not the first to have done a story where the angels are the baddies. Um, Bayonetta, for instance, was uh, famously that. Um, but yeah, it's nice. It's got cool enemy and and uh unit art and design there's lots of interesting i really like the look of these um plant themed animus units for instance um like the big hollows that are like hermit crabs living in broken pots things like that just uh yeah just neat neat to look at um there's a lot more to it than the sort of stereotypical demons so um 
yeah, well recommended. Worth checking out. Um, I don't know if it's still on discount right now, but it's... I think the game is about 20 quid. Uh, 20 pounds UK, so... It's like slightly more expensive than you might assume it was. Um, so, bear that in mind. But other than that, you know, if that's a price you're comfortable paying, it's well worth it. Thank you for watching, everybody, and uh, I'll see you next time.